welcome to our service at Ivy this morning. We seem a little smaller in numbers, but God's presence is here with us for sure. And so glad to see you all on this beautiful sunny morning. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. We're just wanting to continue to remind everyone of all the uh, health department regulations that we have to follow to allow us to continue to worship here in God's presence. So um, I think we'll, we're, we're following those as best as we can. Um, I know there's a little confusion as far as singing goes in Ivy, and um, what we are going to tell you is you're welcome to stand during the music. That is for sure um, a good chance to stretch your legs because when we're having a shortened service, we don't have as many opportunities to stand up. The health department is still um, not suggesting we sing, but it is allowed if you want to sing softly behind your mask. Okay, so. So that's what we'll go with. Um, so it's an individual decision, but as long as you're well masked and just sing softly, that you can join in with the praise songs this morning. Um, also, when we leave the church, we still are, are needing to keep six foot distancing outside. So if we could just sort of move away a little bit from the doorway so that, that other people coming out aren't having to come in close contact with us. Because we are so pleased to be back worshiping together here. Um, leading us this morning, we have Kathy Clark. Kathy comes to us from Westminster Presbyterian Church in Barrie, where she has been an ordained elder since 2016. And until the pandemic started, she also led the pastoral care team for eight years. Since completing her Master of Divinity degree at Tyndale Seminary, Kathy has been blessed to offer the ministry of public supply in several churches across our presbytery. She's been privileged to be part of the RBH Community Chaplaincy Team for the past five years, where she is also the full-time director of safety, security, and occupational health. Kathy is married to Gord, who is also with us this morning somewhere. Good morning, Gord. And together they have four children and three grandchildren. In her spare time, she and Gord love to travel. She sings in two choirs and plays alto sax in a community concert band. And just on a personal note, that's where I first met Kathy. We played together in the very concert band a few years ago. Uh, Kathy has continued that love of, of playing her saxophone in, in, a, in a community band. So we are thrilled, Kathy, to have you leading us in worship this morning. Welcome to Lighty. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am just delighted to, to be with you this morning. And uh, I just, as Winston is walking in, I just want to say, Winston, your prayer for me this morning is the best thing that's happened to me in quite some time, so brother, thank you. Uh, let us uh, worship together, our living God. I want to bring this passage of scripture to you this morning. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Friends, let's gather together with our first hymn, uh, which is a combination of come into his presence and God will make the way.
Friends, please pray with me. God of hope, God of compassion, God of mercy, we are so privileged to be in your presence every moment of our lives. But this morning, this glorious, beautiful, sunny morning, we are so privileged to be gathered here and together as one in your presence. Father, we praise you for all that you have made in this world. We are in awe of your majesty, in awe of your creation. We come before you this morning with humble hearts, with needs in those hearts that we cannot always express. Lord, we are so grateful that you know them, even when we cannot identify them, even to ourselves. Lord, we are smaller in number here, gathered together this morning, but Lord, every person who is part of this church family is in our hearts in this moment. God, we pray that you will be touching the spirit of each one of those families and individuals. Even when we come before you, Father, to rejoice in your creation, we know that we do not always treat your creation as you would have intended. Remind us in you every morning to be good stewards of this earth, good stewards of the gifts that you have given us, gifts of talent, gifts of wisdom and love and compassion. Lord, let us take those gifts, many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, and let us pour those out to others. Be our stewardship of all you have given us Make us in turn a blessing to those that we need. Lord, we, we, may we see your very face in the face of others. May we be your hands and your feet to meet the suffering of others, to come alongside others as they struggle, as they grieve, as they experience loneliness and isolation. Father, this morning, we confess to you that we fall short <clears throat> of those goals every day. Every morning we awaken you and we remember that your mercies are new to us every morning, but we don't always remember that in our dealings with others. Lord, help us to be merciful. Help us to show your love to the world, to be your feet, to be your hands, to be your arms embracing, even when we cannot physically embrace one another. Remind us, Lord, that even in these strange and difficult times that we can be embracing others in prayer, in action, in our generosity and in our love. Renew us this morning. Revive in each and every one of us a fresh sense of your incredible and awesome power. Remind every one of us this morning as we pray, as we listen to your word, as we sing together, remind us anew that we are children of your kingdom, that we are joint heirs with Jesus in all that you have bestowed upon him. We pray all of these things in the perfect and strong name of Jesus, our brother and our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Friends, be assured this morning that the Lord is merciful, and those mercies are new every morning. And you were born to freedom, not to be shackled to your burdens of shame or regret or to be shackled to sin. You are forgiven each and every morning, fresh and anew. And for that, we give thanks to our glorious God. Amen.
No. Normally, I think that you have the scripture read at this time in the service. Uh, as I'm writing that down. This is the and I've actually got the scripture embedded in my sermon, so if it's okay with you, I am actually just going to, to turn right now to, to the sermon. And uh, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, the scripture this morning is from Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to be mostly focusing on verses 4 to 9, but uh, all, of, all of Philippians 4. And I hope that uh, this morning I will bring some fresh thoughts to this beautiful and very familiar passage. So I, I, I wanted to start this morning just by asking you, you know, you know that feeling when you meet someone who is just truly extraordinary? Uh, someone who just seems to be gifted with something a little bit more special than you may feel you have yourself. Maybe you have met someone who just exudes the love of the Lord, or who has a, a particular giftedness that makes you just want to be in their presence. I know there are members of your church family who are those types of extraordinary people because I've met some of you and, and sensed that immediately. And what I have noticed, for me anyways, that every truly extraordinary person that I have ever met has had one highly compelling thing in common. And that is this. They have been quite unaware of their extraordinariness. I actually don't even know if that's a word. But I thought this morning that I'd share just a little sliver of the life of a truly extraordinary woman. And I think it's really safe to say that none of you have ever heard of her. Her name is Agnes Clark. And I dare say that sadly, many of you will never hear of her again. But Agnes Clark was my mother-in-law. And she was, by all accounts, especially her own, an ordinary woman. She was the secretary of her church, which was St. John's Presbyterian in Cornwall, Ontario, for 25 years. And she retired at the age of 65. And, and then, if she were to tell you what she did after that, she would tell you that she led a gentle, quiet life. And to some extent, I think that was probably true. But there was something else about Agnes that she maybe didn't uh, always sense herself. And when a stroke diminished her at the age of 87, she had no choice really, she only has one child board, and she had no choice but to move from her home in Cornwall, a home where she had lived for 50 years, to a long-term care home in Barrie so that Gord could have a, a stronger role in her care. And when she moved, this in her words, quiet, ordinary woman, received staggeringly more than 400 cards and letters encouraging her in her new adventure. And, you know, it's one thing, I think, to know 400 people, but it was just incredible to me that more than 400 individual people took the time to actually write to her. And when I said to that to her, I said, you know, Mom, I can't believe this. This is, this is really extraordinary. She smiled at me knowingly, and she said with a lot of confidence, wow, I think it's my instruction manual. Well, what instruction manual, I asked, first of all, taking the bait, and secondly, just wishing that I had a copy of this thing. She said, well, it's my recipe for living. And then she was a little bit surprised that I didn't know it immediately because she assured me that it was in the Bible. And uh, she felt I was a good biblical scholar and, and was a little bit startled that I didn't immediately know which recipe for living she was talking about. And at that point in her stroke recovery, she couldn't read her Bible herself, and so she asked me to pick it up and read her recipe for living to her. And that's from Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9. And these were the verses that she deeply treasured. So we're going to spend a little bit of time together this morning unpacking this beautiful, familiar passage. And uh, if you want to follow along, I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, in these five verses, Philippians 4, 4 to 9, along with verses 2 and 3, Paul packs in a summary of all of the themes of the book of Philippians. So let's put a little bit of context around those themes by looking at the, the five W's, the what, the when, the why, the from where and to whom Paul was writing these verses. And the entire book of Philippians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And Philippi wasn't a major city, but it was an important one. It was on the Via Ignatia, which was the road that connected Philippi to the sea. And it was a Roman city governed exclusively by Roman law, and its inhabitants were citizens of Rome. And that little fact is important to us because we need to know that the imperial cult of Rome was strong in Philippi. People commonly worshipped the emperors, Caesars like Julius, Augustus, and Claudius. They also worshipped the old Greek gods, gods like Dionysus, the god of wine who could drive a man to madness. Zeus, the god of sky and ruler of the other Greek gods, and Apollo, the god of music and prophecy. And still others worshipped ancient Egyptian gods like Isis, the goddess of magic and fertility, and Osiris, her brother, the god of the dead. And it was believed by the, the people of Philippi that worshipping these old traditional gods secured well-being for the entire city. And as a result, there was a great tension between the early Christians and their worship of a new monotheistic God and the rest of the Philippian community. In the Roman Empire in the first century after the death of Christ, persecution of Christians was common. It was every day. And in, in many ways, while we are certainly not persecuted unto death, we might now be able to see some parallels here in our modern pluralistic society where being a Christian is not entirely in vogue. And remarkably, despite being a persecuted and really impoverished church, the Philippian Christians continued to support Paul in his own mission and ministry. They supported him financially, and this letter to them from Paul is a letter of thanksgiving, a letter to the small group of Christians in Philippi to thank them for the gift they had sent to him and for their constant support. And if you've read the letters of Paul, you will already know that this is really one of the most intimate letters that is included in the Bible. Well, the great American pastor and, and Christian writer Max Licato sets the writing scene perfectly for us. Go back with me, he says, in history a couple of thousand years. Let's go to the city of Rome the thrilling metropolis of gladiators, chariots, and empires. But don't stop at the Colosseum or the palace. Go rather to a, a drab little room, surrounded by high walls. Let's imagine that we can peek into the room and, and take a look. Inside, we see a man seated on the floor. He's an older fellow. His shoulders are stooped. He's balding. Chains are on his hands and feet. And chained to him is a guard from the Roman army. This is the Apostle Paul. Folks, Paul is writing this beautiful, intimate letter from prison. And not while he's serving a sentence for a petty crime. His life, his very life, is at risk here. He faces possible execution and is keenly aware of that. Yet this is a letter of friendship. It's a letter of thanksgiving. And so it is that the main themes of the letter are suffering 
and joy. Joy is a word that appears 16 times in the book of Philippians. And when you think of that setting of the suffering of Paul <coughs> writing about joy, it's really, to me, deeply impactful. And in fact, Paul writes about joy in the midst of suffering, something we can surely relate to. The letter is designed by Paul to increase unity in that small church, to create a sense of partnership and reciprocity amongst the Philippian Christians. And although we're going to focus today on verses 4 to 9 of chapter 4 uh, of this letter, most modern translations also include verses 2 and 3 in this grouping. And in verses 1 to 3, Paul reminds the church to be of one mind in the Lord, to display unity. And I just want to read those to you so you have them in your mind to give a little bit of context. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Well, to be of one mind, as he calls the Philippians 2 in those verses, to be of one mind, to be truly united in Christ, demands mature discipleship of each of us. Mature discipleship. Is the Christian church of one mind these days, do you imagine, truly united in Christ? Are Presbyterians and Pentecostals, Baptists and Anglicans, brethren and united church members, all of one Christian church body, truly united in Christ, on all things theological, on all matters of doctrine and sacrament? It's a rhetorical question that I'll let you answer for you, yourselves, but it's a good one for us to ask. We are called by Christ to be disciples who think the right things, who take the right actions, who have the right attitude, and whose behavior is exemplary. Daryl Johnson, a contemporary expert on preaching, explains this call to mature discipleship far better than I can. He says, we are called to mature discipleship for the simple reason that when the risen and ascended Jesus, Jesus intersects our lives and calls us to follow him in the kingdom life, he calls us onto a different road. Well, Paul lays out our own instruction manual, just like Agnes Clark said a metaphorical Google map for traveling this different road in those verses 4 to 9, with what most modern translations call his exhortations, what the Greeks called paranesis. And these exhortations from Paul fall into two main sections. The first, verses 4 to 7, distinctly cover Christian piety, telling us how to think. The second section, verses 8 and 9, covers Christian ethics and those are really based on the Greco-Roman and Hellenistic ethics and morals, and they tell us how to behave. Think first, and then behave. In both of these sections, Paul uses structure and language that was familiar to the Jewish Philippians. Piety was commonly understood by the Jews to be threefold. The first thing, rejoicing in the Lord. The second, praying. And the third, offering thanksgiving. And all of these elements of piety were to be evidenced outwardly by gentleness and inwardly by the peace of God. According to the wonderful theologian Gordon Fee, this joy of Jewish piety was to be unmitigated, unbridled joy, the kind of joy that perhaps we see most often in children. And it should be this, the distinctive mark of the believer in Christ Jesus. And that's a really interesting thing for us to ponder this morning. How often do you express unbridled joy as a mark of your believer in Jesus? It shouldn't be temporal, but abiding. Not a Christian option, but an imperative, says he. In contrast, the lives of unbelievers are marked by fear and apprehension. My NIV Life Application Bible 
says that joy runs deeper and stronger than fleeting happiness. It's the quiet, confident assurance of God's work in our lives. Happiness <clears throat> depends on happenings, but joy depends on God. So in verse 4, Paul is indeed urging us to mature discipleship, and he starts with a bang. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now remember, Paul is writing from prison, from a place of suffering, and writing to a persecuted people. And yet he calls them to rejoice, and not meekly. He doesn't say, eh, maybe you should rejoice a little. No, he is emphatic. He says, I will say it again, rejoice. I love how Eugene Peterson translates this verse in the message. He says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean revel in Him. This call to rejoice in the very midst of suffering is defiant. It's counter-cultural. It goes against the grain. But Paul doesn't leave it here. This is but the first in his list of imperatives. So what does rejoicing look like for Paul here? He doesn't quote Old Testament scripture like Psalm 100's make a joyful noise, but rather, in verse 5, he moves directly to instructing us that we exude this joy by letting our gentleness, our gentleness be evident to all. That's such a dichotomy, isn't it? Rejoice, have unbridled joy, and let it be seen in your gentleness. And what does Paul mean by gentleness? Well, some, some other translations other than the one I, I often use give a little bit of help with this. Paul means for us to be gentle and kind, to be considerate of others, to be courteous, to be tolerant, to be humble. The great early church father, Augustine, expounds on this by saying, this way of Christ is in the first place humility, in the second place humility, and in the third place humility. In this, Paul evokes the very words of Jesus that we can read ourselves in Matthew 11, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Paul also reminds us here that the Lord is near. His presence is near. In every moment of our lives, if we just take that breath and we pause, we can feel the very present presence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul also meant that God was near to us in the future coming of Christ our King. And remember now, I've, I've mentioned it several times, I know you've got it in your heads, but remember, Paul is suffering greatly and writing to a persecuted church. And in that context, his next exhortation is, is the keystone. He says it plainly. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, there's that word again, let your requests be made known to God actually do this? I, I'm not super perfect at this myself. Have you tried it recently? Just think of, of all the things we think about and worry about in a single day. We worry about <clears throat> money. Perhaps we're worried about our, our coming pensions. We worry about our children. Some of us worry about our aging parents, our jobs, our failing car, our health, our leaky roof, about what to make work for dinner. And we're, when we're done with all of that, most of us worry some more about money. And that's not even including a single worry about the pandemic. And the pandemic has brought our worry, our capacity to torment ourselves with disturbing thoughts to a whole new level. The psychologist, uh, Dr. Bruce Davis, estimates that we each have about 50,000 thoughts a day, just general random thoughts, 50,000 of them a day. But what if only 10% of those were thoughts about worries? Well, that would mean that we were each having 5,000 worries a day. 
And, and I don't know about you, but I feel like my worrying has doubled during the, the pandemic. Could I, could you be having 10,000 worrying thoughts a day? I mean, yikes. Uh, so, so pervasive is worry in our culture. There's actually a website called worrybank.com. So you go to this website, you fill in a form, and then you, with the click of a button, you deposit it, metaphorically, into this, this virtual worry bank. I don't know what happens to it after that, but supposedly, making this deposit, well, just take this worry right out of your mind. Well, with five to 10,000 worries a day, I'm going to be having to spend quite a bit of time on worrybank.com. And if making the worry deposit, turns out that doesn't work for you, the site has some really helpful suggestions on how else you might, well, distract yourselves from worrying. Here's some of the suggestions there. They're really quite profound. Clean the soap dishes. Try to refold the map. Study the lines in your hand. Or my personal favorite one that actually does work for me, color in a coloring book. Well, the reality is, of course, that today is the tomorrow we were worrying about yesterday. Was it worth it? As the wonderful missionary, someone I had the great joy of meeting in person, Corey Tendu, said, Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It saps today of its strength. So it's quite possible that, that today is the perfect day for each and every one of us to resign from our worrying roles as, as CEO of the entire universe. Because, frankly, worrying diverts us from God. When we worry, when we're anxious, it's as if we're saying that our problems are, frankly, just too big for God. Too big for God. Wow. So actually thinking about it this morning, I've had a lot of worries lately, and I actually did wonder, which one of those worries is too big for God? It's a rhetorical question for you as well, of course, but if you can actually name a worry you're carrying around with you that's too big for God, you'll want to revisit Philippians 4, verse 6. Uh, as my friend, the pastor, uh, uh, well, I think he's actually left First Baptist Church now, but Jody Cross said, you better choke worry before worry chokes you. And the way to choke worry, my friends, <clears throat> is by praying to God about everything and be specific. Sometimes I'm a bit lazy in this regard, I don't know about you, but I have been known just to pray generally, God, please just, you know, lift my burdens, and I don't bother to name any of them. Now, yes, I know what you're going to tell me. Surely God must know my needs. That's what I often tell myself. Of course God knows our needs, but by praying about our worries, by naming them specifically, we do two things. First, we acknowledge our total dependence on God. And secondly, we keep our mind stayed on Christ. And whatever occupies our minds actually determines our actions. But Paul also urges us to pray with thanksgiving. Prayer without thanksgiving is what? It's complaining to God. It's whining. It's not mature discipleship. It's more childlike in nature. Thankful prayer is the anti-anxiety medication that so many of us are desperate for. As Paul, ass Paul assures us, when we replace anxiety with thankful prayer, we will be rewarded by God in the most perfect way. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds. I can't think of anything more beautiful than that image. The peace of God guarding my heart and my mind. And here again, Paul uses imagery that the Philippians could relate to. Many of their citizens were formerly Roman soldiers, granted land in return for their service, and so the century image of God guarding their hearts resonated. And it's an image that is just as powerful today. God standing on guard for us in total control of our lives. 
granting us inner contentment, quiet, gentle restfulness, hope and despair, and calm serenity. The very antithesis or opposite of anxiety and worry. The theologian Frank Thielman calls us to remember that the success of the gospel and the shape of our personal circumstances do not depend on our efforts, but lie in the hands of our all-powerful and merciful God. Paul ends this section of chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, with a list of moral imperatives. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things. This is a verse that's it's just loaded with meaning. First of all, this list of imperatives includes several that were really common uh, to the Hellenistic or Greco-Roman moral code. Again, Paul using familiar images to reach his audience. And depending on which translation you're reading, the word whatever is repeated as many as seven times. It really serves to emphasize that these are absolute truths that act as our moral compass. They set out our standards of behavior. Much more frequently, Paul is prone to giving us a list of virtues to illustrate the depravity of unbelievers or to encourage believers to avoid vices or even to expose the failure of leaders. But here, Paul offers us a list to describe what is required of Christians, Christian leaders, just everyday ordinary Christians, of mature, of mature disciples. The other important thing that Paul does with the single verse of verse 8, he ties it clearly to Philippian culture as he does this. And it's to remind us that as he wrote to the Christians in Rome, that though we must not be of the world, we must nevertheless be in the world. Paul tells us here to think about beauty, truth, honor, excellence, wherever we find it. And this means that we are to observe these things in the everyday of our lives, in the books we read, in the movies we watch, in art. When we keep our minds stayed upon Christ through prayer and through mature disciple, discipleship, we will be able to discern what is appropriate for us to partake from the world around us. And of course, Paul knew that we can't always rely on our own judgment or discernment. We are, after all, each and every one of us, hopefully flawed humans. So he leaves us with verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Paul offers himself up as our moral compass. He leaves us with the blessed assurance that when we follow his example, which is indeed the example of Christ Jesus, the God of peace will be with us. Can there be a more blessed assurance? I want us to come back to Agnes Clark, that ordinary woman with an extraordinary number of friends, living out the recipe for living in what was truly mature discipleship. In 1970, Cornwall, Ontario was an absolute bedrock of conservatism. It was still deeply enmeshed in racial prejudice. And on a cold night in December of that year, Agnes's very best friend from decades opened her front door to find her daughter and her daughter's new husband arriving unexpectedly on furlough from the African mission field. What her best friend's daughter hadn't mentioned was that her new husband was African and black. This mother banished her missionary daughter immediately, without hesitation, sent her right back out the door into that cold night, literally closed the door on her face. But an hour later, Agnes's doorbell rang. She opened her door to this very same couple. Knowing that her lifelong friendship with this young woman's mother was probably about to end, Agnes Clark opened her door and said, Welcome. Welcome. 
That young woman eventually left the mission field and she became a pastor. And uh, in December 2012, 42 years after she received that welcome into Agnes's home, she traveled many, many, many miles to sit silently at the back of the church during Agnes's funeral. So about that instruction manual that Agnes spoke of, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, in Paul's own words, friends, just put it into practice. Amen. Let's join together again in uh, this wonderful hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. <coughs> Already women are 
almost confined to their homes. Lord, strengthen your people in Afghanistan. Shine a light into that dark and troubled corner of the world. Lord, we know from your servant Jeremiah that you know the plans that you have. Plans for our welfare, not for harm, to give us a future and a future of hope. Lord, find a way for those women and girls in Afghanistan to sense a future with hope. The chest of God of the universe. We pray for the people in the country of Greece as massive and devastating fires continue to overtake parts of that country. We pray to you for the people of California where <clears throat> massive fires are also burning, the people of our own province of British Columbia where these fires bring such destruction, devastation. Lord, where you come behind the fire, fill these spaces with Ruah, we pray. Your very breath. We pray, Lord, as always, for so many, many months, for our own country of Canada and how we continue to evolve and manage during this pandemic. Lord, be a presence in our country where we are start, starting to see a divide, harsh words being spoken, increasing fear as there are new variants of the virus. Continue to strengthen our healthcare workers. Uphold them with your mighty right hand. Calm the hearts of parents as we start to see more young children being infected with this illness. Or two, in our communities, we have an increasing crisis of opioid addiction. This is such evidence of suffering and pain, despair, and an absence of hope. Lord, you promised to us in your words to Joshua that you will be with us everywhere we go. Lord, be with those who are struggling, who may not yet know you intimately. Come alongside them. May they just be filled with a sense of your peace. May your peace push out their despair and their hopelessness. Would we pray for our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau? We pray for our Premier Doug Ford and our Mayor of our own community, Sandy McDonald. Father, most urgently we pray, we pray for members of this congregation, of this church family, while we are not speaking all of those needs and burdens of this family out loud, we know that you do know the needs. We know that when we come to the foot of the cross, we can set our burdens there and leave them entirely in your care and keeping. Father, please enfold us in your arms. Bring everyone a sense of your comfort and peace. Draw near to those in our community who may be brokenhearted. Gently wipe every tear from those eyes. What a friend we have in you, Jesus. Lord, in this time of COVID-19, many of us have been so isolated, many are still isolated. When we are weary and alone, remind us that you are an ever-present God loving us, guiding us. Remind us that we need only reach out to you in a simple prayer, and you are near. Lord, with every breath we take, may we breathe in your awe, your very breath, drawing in your peace, your love, your grace. For you are a mighty God, and we serve you.
We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Before I offer the benediction, I wanted to leave you with these really powerful words that Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>